Okay, so this is the next stage in the LT95 gearbox out of my um, 1972 Range Rover project. Uh, excuse me, hickety the uppities. So I've installed the uh, transfer gear on the end of the main shaft and we've installed the little snap ring. Um, you can see the end of the snap ring there by my finger. It's blurred. Um, so that's, that's in now. That's taken up all the end float on the main shaft as predicted. I've then put in the intermediate gears. So basically we've got the, um, what have we got here? This is the high range gear down here, a low range gear at the top. It's blowing a bit of a gale out there today. Um, so we've got high range at the bottom, low range at the top, and there is a ring. It might be easier if I go in through here, and you can see high range at the bottom, low range at the top. My fingers are now gonna move the selector up and down. So when it's down and I turn, you see the bottom gear is turning, the top gear is doing nothing, and move it up, and now the bottom gear is not doing anything and the top gear works. So there's a selector rod that connects up to this ring here. Um, there's nothing particularly rocket science-y um, about this intermediate gears. They fit together more or less like that. These bits here are the critical parts because obviously you need to measure um, to make sure that there's not too much end float within the shaft as it fits in. And those are all pear-shaped washers. You can probably see the one at the top. Well, not really, it's there. Um, and the idea is that between the two pear washers, which hold the whole assembly together, um, it should be a nice snug fit. Uh, but it needs to be uh, 9 thou to 14 thou of an inch um, gap, which you measure just between the gearbox casing and the edge of the ring. Which there is, because with the shaft in place, I can move the ring around. Um, but there's 10 thou on that one, which is enough for it to operate. That means it'll work nicely. So, now we've done the um, gear on the end of the main shaft. We've done the high and low range. Next part is the diff uh, and the centre diff. And then I can put the front and back extensions on uh, and put all the gasket faces and so forth on. So, <clears throat> that's that fella in there. Look at that. It's beautiful. Um, I've got a feeling that it has been rebuilt at some point. Like, everything in this gearbox is in really, really good shape. So I'm just going to give it a quick blow off. That just didn't sound right, did it? I'm just going to give it an air dust um, and then install it into the box, check the uh, end float on it, um, and then I'll be back to you. So this is the, uh, the, the centre diff, the front output shaft, the rear output shaft, and obviously the prop shafts go onto there and there. And this whole assembly goes through this hole. So the rear goes at this end, the front goes at the other end. Um, and the differential goes through the middle of it. So what you've basically got then is you've got the drive gear. Um, so drive gear goes on to the differential, okay? So that, that is driven. Like a car differential, you drive the outer pinion. And then at the moment, and this might work because I can only work one-handed, we can see I'm turning one end and it's turning the differential, but not turning the other end as a differential would work. Okay, so basically means that although the car's four-wheel drive, only one of the four wheels at any given time is being driven by the car, potentially. Um, and that's because you've got differentials in the middle, which will send the uh, drive to the point of least resistance on either axle. Um, and then on each axle, the differential in the back axle, or the front axle, will then send the drive to the point of least resistance, which is great because it means that you've got four-wheel drive, but only one of the dri wheels is actually driven, if you get my drift. Right, now, the clever bit with this is in here. Um, so this is then the uh, the diff lock. So that vacuum device that I showed you earlier on uh, would move this fork here. So let me try and get that engaged. There's a, a selector ring on here, and if it's going to behave, then it will go in. Right, let me pause for a second. It needed two hands basically so basically that ring there moves backwards and forwards and when it's backwards like that then the front output shaft is not locked to the main differential casing when it goes forwards and of course it's not going to now because it's moved half a millimeter there it is sort of gone in one second there we are, back again. All you've got to do is kind of, you've got to wiggle that and wiggle that and then it goes straight in, okay? Because obviously you need movement in order for it to work. So now that's happened, 
let me put a weight on that end and when I turn you see that it's turning the whole shaft the whole shaft is now locked as one so what this means now is that I've got my glove all over the bloody image there what it means now is that one wheel on each of the two axles will be driven uh, which gives you a fighting chance of getting out of the sticky stuff or the snow or whatever you're in um, these things can be made more complicated but as far as a centre differential is concerned you wouldn't normally want anything more complex than this it's either on or it's off on more modern Range Rovers this whole process takes place within this unit here on the end here there's a viscous coupling uh, which detects the change in speed between the rear axle and the front axle drive which is in the middle there there's a, a toothed cog um, and then if it detects the change in speed as being too much i.e. one axle slipping then it will just lock itself up automatically on the older cars you have to stop you have to pull a plunger sends a vacuum from the engine moves that selector ring you then lock both axles um, which is good because it gets you out the sticky stuff but bad if you're on the road so unless one of the wheels can start slipping then you're going to soon start breaking drive shafts and so forth so that's how the uh, the differential unit works now inside here there is a world of little bits and bobs and cogs and stuff i'm not going to bother taking it apart it's in really good shape from the outside i'm going to trust it on the inside it works i'm not going to tempt fate so if there is a problem it's fairly easy to get it out you t take the um the, the rear output housing off even with the gearbox in place you can get access to this thing it's, it's not the end of the world um so i'll, I'll i'm going to um, trust it that it works because it worked before um, I took the gearbox apart. Um, I've given it a quick clean over. I've checked the torque on the bolts because these undo. Bearings and gears are all in good shape, so I'm going to pop it in. Um, right, okay, so um, transfer gears. Um, these are the transfer gears in here. You've got high and low range, um, and there's a little selector that slides between them that engages the high or the low range. It's not auto focusing for some reason because my hammers are probably in the way, so it engages high or low range. This occurs uh, via the action of two rods. There's a cross shaft. Well, it's actually a, a longitudinal shaft. that goes from front to back of the box, and this goes that way or that way. And on this thing, there's a slot. And in that slot goes the cross shaft onto which the handle on the gearbox cover goes up and down, wiggles up and down, and moves the gears in or out. So on this thing, uh, one is held in by a roll pin, currently just held in place by a long nail. Uh, the other one is by a pinch pin um, and what you do is when you set this up against the um, the carrier uh, you need to make sure that there's enough of a of a gap i think it's 25 thou of an inch um, in order to allow it to slide backwards and forwards so that this thing works you can see it's got some detents on here for detent balls and springs now there's one that drops in that hole there and it's got like a long rod and goes all the way down to where the shaft comes through in that hole there the other one goes through this little axis hole and pushes through and goes into this area here. So it pushes longitudinally. Um, now I found from the manual that the best way to install the rod, even though the rod goes from that hole to oh, on the front of that hole, you really need to install it from the back. So what we need to do is get the spring and the ball into that hole through here. I've left my short magnet at home push the rod in from that direction, making sure that the orientation of the rod will allow, and I'll show you this, for the pinch bolt on one of the forks. Thank you, gravity. Uh, and you see there's a recess in there for the pinch bolt to go through. So it needs to make sure that that recess is on the side of the gearbox nearest where the handle is going to be, furthest away from the transfer gears. So let me um, assemble. Um, and then I shall um, go through what it is I've done. It's a fairly straightforward process. It's well covered in the manuals. Um, just that sometimes the manuals don't show you what it looks like inside a gearbox. Okay, so useful tip on getting that horizontal spring in and the ball. Uh, first and foremost, the spring looks like that. It's about what, just over an inch long. That was easy. Shove it in through that hole. Push it in with a, with a dowel. Position the rod. And then what I did put a punch into the hole rolled the pin in to where the shaft is going to come through pushed it in with the rod because i tried all sorts of things like gluing it to the end of the rod and all sorts of things and then pushed the shaft in and that's basically worked 
So the shaft has now gone in and it's got the ball in place. So the next thing I'm going to need to do is put these two um, selectors on. So that's the front selector. That's the back selector. So he goes into place. He goes into place in there. I'm working one-handed as usual. Really ought to get some sort of bloody head cam. Or maybe not. Bore you guys shitless then with the silly things that I do. Right, I'm just gonna. No, it's not. I'm gonna have to do it two handed. I'll be back in a minute. Right, so here I've positioned both of the selector rods onto the selector ring. You can see down there the hole on the shaft. That's the hole that the, uh, the roll pin needs to go through for that shaft there. My hand's making it go out of focus. So, what I need to do now is push this through the gearbox until the roll pin hole lines up but also make sure that the recess which is there on the shaft is on the right side for the pinch bolt so let me push it in and i'll show you with with the uh, with the pinch bolt in place our roll pins installed um, i've attached the pinch bolt you select neutral gear so neither the front nor the back high or low ratio gears are engaged and you can see the selector is bang in the middle and then what we need to do is from the rear selector between the rear selector and the selector ring uh, needs to be 10 thou so i'll push that into place uh, and this uh, spring i put in down here this horizontal spring allows you to lock it into neutral um, because it's very very definitely in neutral here so what i'm going to do now is uh, nip up that pinch bolt then i'm going to uh, put in the cross shaft uh, so it comes in two parts it's got this little knob thing um, and it's got the main shaft um, which is kind of part of the handle so let me this is the um, selector rod that goes on the cross shaft and sits in that slot down there on the shaft that moves the uh, uh, i guess the selector ring backwards and forwards between the transfer gears there's no synchro mesh on these by the way you have to basically be stopped in order to change them or match the revs if you double the clutch so effectively what needs to happen is that goes down into that slot and on the cross shaft so give me one second right so i've put the nobule into the shaft and now the handle is on the end there so when i move this back and forth you can see it's moving the selector ring okay that's pretty much it there's nothing really that complex on these um, selector, this uh, high-low selector rod. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. The only thing that I am lacking um, is, I'm pretty sure that there should be a spacer in here to stop the shaft from coming out like that and then the selector disengaging from its little nobule. Um, there is a hole on this end of the shaft and I could potentially put some spaces in there. Uh, but I'm going to look into that. I'll have to get the parts manual out. Right, so the way this works is you get a ball which goes into the hole. We choose the right hole, not the wrong hole. That's the right hole. I'm pretty sure that's the, that's the right hole. It goes in. See ya. Then a spring. There he goes. Oh, actually, let me just double check the spring goes. Yeah, I think the spring goes first. And then there's this extension shaft that then goes on top. Um, and when I push that down, when the cover's on, it pushes down on that shaft um, and will lock it into a high or a low ratio, stop it jumping out of gears. And that's really what this thing is for, to stop it jumping out of gears. Right, so let me crack on with this thing now. I'm going to replace those seals. It's freezing here today. It's about, well, it was about four degrees. It's now down to about two or three degrees. Um, yeah, I'm blowing steam. Um, right, so let me get this thing done, because I want to put this in the car tomorrow. I've got to put the mountings on it still. The mountings just go on the outside either side. And what I'll do is I'll drop it into the car, bolt it up to the mountings, and then rest it on the cross member in the car with a block of wood underneath it. Um, really just to get it out of the way, because it's quite a bulky unit, um, and it's taking up a lot of room in the workshop. And if it's all done, then I don't really want it around anymore. It needs to go in the car. Okay. But, uh, yeah, we're getting there with this LT95 gearbox. It's a weighty bastard, I can tell you. It really is. Um, 
So all I can do is lift one end of it. Now all the transfer gears and everything are in place. When it had no bell housing, no transfer gears, just the main shaft and the lay shaft, I could just lift it. 